Hello and welcome back to Remoticon. Uh, my name is Jasmine Brackett, um, I run Tindy, and I'd like to introduce our next guest. Uh, you may have seen uh, the Plasma channel on YouTube focusing on high voltage physics. Its host and creator um, is today will be furthering his long term goal of inspiring development in plasma physics by sharing high voltage experiments with you today. He'll demonstrate a little how physics shapes the worlds around us and why the future lies in plasma physics. Please enjoy Jay Bowles as he takes you for a dip into the plasmaverse. Let me uh, put the spotlight on you, Jay. Oh, there you go. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate that. We can um, hear you. You stole, my, you stole my tagline there. I was gonna, I was gonna <laughs> plug the, the title name there, but thank you for doing it anyways. But really- Good title. Yeah. Yeah, really excited to be here. Like, I'm really grateful to be able to share my passion with everybody at Hackaday and also everybody who's watching here because what you're about to see is going to be some custom chosen situations and experiments and uh, scientific processes that I've kind of discovered or figured out over the past 17 years. So what you're about to see is a lifelong passion of mine that I've had since I was 15. So, oh, wow, that's 18 years. 18 years I've been doing this. Everything, every high voltage application you can think of. And um, this presentation might be a little bit different from ones uh, you might have seen earlier today. I'm going to switch between uh, a PowerPoint presentation with some information I want to share and um, also some live demonstrations here at the table, which it looks like my framing is a little wonky, but we'll, we'll work with that. We'll work with that. And uh, yeah, really, really excited to be able to share my passion. Uh, I don't have a degree in engineering. I don't have a degree in plasma physics. I have a degree in science and I am self-taught for about 18 years uh, through doing this through almost daily or, or weekly occurrences. Uh, but yeah, I have three specific demonstrations I wanna show you that hopefully kind of get the gears turning for, you know, if I can inspire just a couple of people to make you start questioning what's possible with plasma physics or high voltage physics, then I have had a good day. And, um, you know, with that being said, and thank you for, just for, for stealing my, uh, my title line there, but I think it's time for us to take a dip into the Plasmaverse. And quick note, I have the PowerPoint presentation skills of a seven-year-old, so hopefully you guys like pictures because I really like pictures too. That's about where we're sitting at with skill level here. A quick, um, quick note about why I'm so passionate about plasma physics, high voltage physics in general. It's maybe I'm biased because I'm, I'm self-taught. I, I have self-taught engineering skills and I'm a maker, I'm a builder. Perhaps I'm biased from that, but I think high voltage physics is an extremely tangible field of science. You know, and a lot of the things we've seen in the past that are remarkable that we now take for granted, and even a lot of things now that you walk around and, and take for granted currently, a lot of them are high voltage based, right? So let's give a couple examples here. It's extremely tangible because anytime you go past a, let's say a, a district with a neon signs, a bars, restaurants, whatever it is, neon sign, that's a noble gas inside of a, ga a glass tube ionized because of a high voltage current going through it. And the color of that neon sign is a result, you know, the wavelength is a result of the mixture of gases you have inside of it. We all take that for granted. Radio communication, well, that started out as a high voltage endeavor. You know, good old Tesla himself and also Marconi, all the original radio transmitters in the past were spark gap high voltage transmitters and then probably a very common example that is the most applicable to every single person at least uh, in western countries would be the microwave oven right you know little susie here she likes her hot pockets but little does she know it's taking about one and a half thousand to two and a half thousand volts to create the microwaves to cook that food but uh, susie likes her hot pockets you know and then we also have particle accelerators. We have ionic propulsion. We have a lot of um, high voltage physics has a lot of implications for future use and directing us in a positive direction. However, as exotic as some of those are, uh, that's not really where my interest lies. My interest lies in particular, both on the YouTube channel and my personal interest for 18 years in really exotic applications. And like I said, I've, I've custom chosen three experiments I'm gonna show that are exotic in my definition uh, because high voltage applied in exotic situations nearly always produces an exotic result and that's what i've found this picture in the upper right hand corner of the fire into the hand that is a still frame from a discovery channel episode 
where I was demonstrating fire bending, which is one of the demonstrations I'll do today on a smaller scale. I have my computer right next to me, so I'm, I'm dumbing down that fire size a little bit for, for safety. Um, but you're going to see electrostatic fire bending. Now, that's what I'd consider a tangible, real world application of high voltage. Also, lower left hand corner, as kind of the, the word suggests, cleansing ozone. Uh, last year, I made a, a device that will sterilize your hands with about five to seven seconds, and it is a complete sterilization. Uh, obviously, you don't want to sterilize your hands all the time, every day. That's not a good, good thing to do, but every once in a blue moon, uh, having the opportunity to completely sterilize a surface using high voltage corona, which is the purple stuff you're seeing in that picture, um, has some big advantages. Now, the first demonstration that I am really excited to show, uh, it's, it may work right away, it may not work right away, it's, it's extremely organic. It'll decide, it'll work if it, if it wants to. So hopefully in the first or second try, we'll get this electrostatic levitation going. But it allows me to teach a couple of concepts. First of all, high static voltage does not always equate to high lethality. Now, uh, what matters is leakage current or the actual current experienced across your body and you know, a time constant, there's a bunch of variables. So a high static voltage does not automatically mean that uh, it's a lethal voltage. Uh, to charge myself up, which I'll be charging myself to about 60,000 volts for two of these experiments, I will be using what's called a Cockroft Walton voltage multiplier, which uh, you'll see when I zoom the camera back out here shortly to the table, I'll point it out. Uh, I custom build these devices. I build them myself so I know that they're safe, which is why I'm gonna do this. <laughs> but it charges my body to 60,000 volts DC. Uh, the bottom plate you'll see in this picture, that's just a metal, uh, a metal plate, I forget where I get it, and it's attached to the electrical ground of the voltage multiplier. It's, in theory, a relative ground voltage, and I will end up charging myself up to 60,000 volts, and energy is essentially going to flow between my hand to that ground plate, but the mechanism that causes the energy flow uh, is also the mechanism that causes a piece of um, foil to levitate. So I would like to start off with, oh, oh so sorry, framing is off by a little bit here, but uh, this is the voltage multiplier. I have a bunch right off screen that are about 10 times bigger, but I prefer not to kill myself right now. Uh, now this produces 60 kilovolts. The output is on the top and it, a wire is connected from the top down to a uh, well insulated stool on the ground. On top of the ground, I've put some aluminum foil. So I will end up actually standing on top of this when the power is on. So I'm isolated from ground and charged to about 60 kilovolts DC. And hopefully, you'll see a bit of levitation. This is the example of that foil boat. That shape is very particular. So uh, it's a little harder to see right now, but those two sharp corners. Um, are very important on the base. It's not the only shape that works, but it is a shape that works pretty efficiently for the application I want to do. Uh, now, I'm charged to 60 kilovolts, and I've found that with this device, I shock myself every time I turn it on. So I'm going to turn it on with a glass rod so I don't shock myself. And hopefully, you will have a chance to see this work on the first time. And it is a really, really cool thing to see electrostatic levitation. Let's give it a try. Watch me shock myself. Oh, let's give this a second try. This was pretty normal part of this application right here. <laughs> cool. Let's give it a try again. It's important that the top plate is completely parallel to the bottom plate at all times. This is a little bit off screen right now. But once it levitates, you will hopefully see it a little bit better. So my hand right here. Well, oh. that is troublesome. It, uh, it actually decided to break right now. Let's, um, let's give this one a try, hold on. There we go. There we go, a little bit temperamental. Glad this is working. Okay, so this is, you can actually see a little bit of it spinning underneath my hand. It's, it's levitating right underneath my hand and it'll follow your hand even up and down a little bit to a certain extent. 
Now it's going to spin a little bit because that's its natural state of finding stability. It's a state called a quasi-stable equilibrium, and you can even choose to levitate it with the back of your hand. And if you've done the experiment just right, oh, not that time. Uh, really glad that power source did not break like I thought I had just done. But really interesting feeling where you can feel this tugging on the bottom side of your hand, and you can also feel a little bit of wind. And I'll talk about what that wind is. It's called ionic wind. But uh, there's a couple mechanisms on how exactly this works. Um, let me go back to our, our uh, PowerPoint here. So some observations about what you just saw and some, some blatant facts about how, how the mechanism is going to work. Uh, first of all, it's inherently a lossy system. So I don't know if you heard while I was talking, there was a hissing noise and also a high frequency noise. Uh, that's indicative of energy loss. And that hissing noise is uh, also indicative of energy leaving the system. So if you didn't have a constant input of power, uh, this system would, it would work for a split second and that's about it. Now what causes that levitation is a static pole and ionic, a static push and pull between the two plates, the ground plate in my hand, but also an ionic wind that causes thrust upwards, which again, I'll talk about. Um, but this is not stable by definition. By scientific standards, this is called quasi-stable levitation. It follows Earnshaw's theorem, which uh, dictates that a point charge within a static electric field could never be perfectly stable, only quasi-stable at best. So here's how it achieves quasi-stable levitation. Uh, stage one, my hand or the top plate in this, this picture you're seeing is negatively charged, severely negatively charged at a high voltage. That top plate repels electrons in the foil boat and the bottom plate is a relative positive voltage. It's a ground voltage, but compared to me, it's a positive voltage and it attracts electrons down. Well, the second stage is the electrons naturally accumulate at sharp points on the base of the boat. This is a natural inherent property of uh, high voltage physics of high voltage electricity is sharp points accumulate electrons at a higher rate and because of that those points will have much stronger electric field gradients around the corners. Uh, that higher electric field gradient will uh, cause the air to become ionized and electrons will actually fly off of the corners and it's interesting it depends on your polarity, but i'm choosing to discuss the polarity where electrons fly off, but this creates ionic wind at the base so. As I mentioned, there's an electrostatic push and pull, but there's also this ionic wind thrust component. And how does it self-regulate? Why doesn't it just shoot up to the top? Or why doesn't it just shoot out to the side? Well, let's look at the too high scenario. Um, actually, when it gets too high to the upper plate, my hand, it is too far away from the bottom plate to have much of an influence on the relative positive charge of the base. And contrary to what you think, it actually also loses its charge too quickly when it gets too, um, too high up there. Let's look at the too low situation. Uh, there's not enough negative plate influence on it because it's too far from the top now. And actually the boat becomes net positive and tends to be repelled back up uh, towards that negative plate. So it's a, it's a push and pull that um, it self-regulates. And uh, that's how it achieves a quasi-stable levitation. <clears throat> now, the second thing I wanna show is hopefully I don't uh, burn myself doing this like I've done a million times, but it's electrostatic fire bending. It's using the same process. I'll be standing on a uh, electrically insulated stool, same thing, powered by the voltage multiplier, 60 kilovolts. But a quick note about about how I discovered uh, how I discovered this fire bending. It uh, I have much bigger voltage multipliers and. I had a big one on and I had lit a candle and I walked past the voltage multiplier for, for whatever reason. I don't know why. And I noticed that the, the candle flame bent in exactly like this picture with my hand, but I didn't intend for it to happen. And I noticed, oh, that's strange. So I walked back towards the voltage multiplier and moved in closer and it pulled the flame off of the wick. And that's when I noticed something funky was happening that, okay, fire is easily influenced by an electrostatic charge because fire is an electrically conductive partial plasma. This is debatable in academia. Some sources will cite it as a plasma. Some will sort it not, uh, cite it not as a plasma. So I consider it to be a partially uh, electrically conductive partial plasma. 
um, those positive and ne negative ions inside of the fire is what allows it to be externally influenced. It's, it's super cool. Hopefully it works on camera here in a second. Again, body will be charged to about 60 kilovolts DC negative. The low camera angle right now will actually work in our favor for a second. But uh, again, I'll be charged 60 kilovolts DC. This plate is a ground, a relative positive voltage and the candle sits on the ground. Now, wax is a good insulator, but sitting on the ground plate, it does have a very relatively weak grounding connection. Oh, okay, the candle decided to show up, excellent. That was about to be a very short demonstration. Um, now, I also wanted to do a larger demonstration, kind of like what you saw in that picture with it bending into my hand. Uh, I found that with so much equipment, so close, it, uh, it posed a lot of inherent risk. So we're going to do a candle, and as long as I can demonstrate that you can influence this, this fire with charges, hopefully you'll walk away with a couple of gears turning in your head. So normal candle. Let's zoom in here. Normal candle, not influenced whatsoever. Sure, you could, you could blow it around. It's influenced that way. But it's not influenced otherwise. But the moment then the object next to it is electrostatically charged to a high voltage, AKA my hand. Let's be, ah, that was too soon. That was too soon. That's okay. Now, hopefully you saw a little bit of that influence. That happened too soon. <laughs> Come on, relight. One more time. Again, I'm standing on that insulated stool. If I was not on an insulated stool, the past demonstration and this demonstration wouldn't work. I need to be off of the ground for this to work. So you've got influence to the left side. Hopefully you see that a little bit. Hard to see on camera here, I'm seeing. To the right side, okay. We've got, a, we've got a candle flame that's not wanting to behave, but um, I have a video on this. You can get a much larger flame. The maximum size of gotten is about six, actually eight to 10 inches. Um, you can have it leap into your hand on the right, onto the left, but the explanation for how this candle flame is influenced by electrostatic fields isn't just as simple as, well, it's positively charged, I'm negatively charged. So it's attracted. It's actually much more complicated than that because I found you can reverse it and be uh, high positive voltage with that being negatively charged and you have the exact same impact. So it's not inherently just because of the ions inside of the flame. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the observations and lessons. I wanted to get to this slide because Unfortunately, you didn't get a very good example of that fire bending here on camera. It, um, it's a little hard to see and it blew itself out twice, but you can get it looking like this on the base. It can actually split in half. So it's okay, it's not positive or negative charge based entirely. That's just one of the elements. But uh, this poses an inherent danger, of course. You are attracting fire to your body. Um, not necessarily the safest thing, but the attractive effect is scalable. And like I said, I've gotten about an eight to 10 inch diameter bowl full of rubbing alcohol, lit it on fire, and it's actually able to bend towards your hands. So it's scalable up if you increase the voltage of the object next to the fire, AKA your body. But what's really important to uh, take into account is, oh, uh, apologies. What's important to take into account is, well, can this be reversed? Can this effect be reversed? That's what the world would be uh, beneficial to have. That's what I would love to know. Can the effect be repulsive? Because the implications of repelling fire are much safer than the implications of attracting fire. So results are inconclusive at this time. The closest thing we have is ionic wind, which the uh, same exact thing I mentioned with the bottom of that foil boat, all it is is actual wind itself. So that's, that's not electrostatic repulsion. That's just wind blowing fire away. But um, I mentioned it's more than just the static charges that have an impact. It's also because the flame path may be following the electric field lines present between your hand 
and the grounded plate that the candle is sitting on. Now fire is uh, in a lot of regards, so it's lighter than air. It is uh, extremely fluid. It's influenced by those external charges as one of the variables, but it also wants to take the path of least resistance because the flame is conductive and it, um, it wants to conduct, you know, close the circuit between my hand and plate as much as it can. The last demonstration, which is not one that can blow out or a power source die on, thankfully, um, is an atmospheric corona motor. Uh, some of you watching might have seen this. Maybe you haven't heard of it. Maybe you have. This is something I didn't hear about until about two years ago. Uh, very exotic form of motor because magnetic motors, as you know them, uh, they require high current. Even the smallest little battery powered motor conceptually uses a high current to create an electromagnetic field. Corona motors are completely different. They can run off extremely low currents at high voltages. And inherently, like a high static voltage, a high static charge, that inherently is uh, symbolic of stored energy. And the rotational movement of the rotor and the motor acts as the vector to transfer that charge. I'm gonna go back to the live feed here. My camera is consistently zooming in more and more. Bear with me one second. Ah, it's, uh, it's got a mind of its own, this, this uh, camera. It's a little bit better. <laughs> Let's take a look. Uh, this is the framing how it was supposed to be the whole time, but the camera's doing its own, own thing. So uh, this is the corona motor we saw a picture of, which I'll talk about more in detail and show you. Uh, there are no wires present except for the wires connecting up these support beams. There are six support beams, and on each support beam, there is a fin, a sharp fin, which you'll see in detail with some pictures here shortly. Uh, there are no magnets involved, and this can run off extremely low currents, but at high voltages. And this is important. Why, why is a corona motor different from other motors? Well, I've been doing this for 17 years. It is far more easy to generate a high voltage than it is to create a high current. And anybody in the modern world who's taken clothes out of a dryer right after they're done, you know exactly what I'm talking about. All that static clinginess of your clothes, 5, 10, 15,000 volts generated no problem. When you get out of your car to gas up your, your car too quickly and you rub against the seat, thousands of volts right there. It's easier to create a high static voltage than it is to create a high current. So you can actually use this in situations um, which we'll talk about here shortly, which is really cool. Let me, doo -doo -doo. framing is killing me here. This is a, a small Wimshurst machine. It just creates about 10, 15,000 volts DC. It's safe to touch, just makes big gnarly sparks. It's really fun. It's a great power source for this. So fundamentally, this spins off of a, uh, I'll talk about it here shortly, positive and negative charges that are being transferred between the fins. Uh, there we go, taking a second to spin up. Longer than I would have liked, a little motor. Um, the fastest I've gotten with this design is about 800 RPM. And Corona motors can be scaled up, built completely differently. But the fundamental principle of Corona motors, which you can, it's now blurring on camera. I don't think you can see the individual movements. Is that they operate off of that, that high static voltage. Here it is uh, a little bit closer up. No magnets, again, just using electrostatics. But the question at hand is, um, how exactly does that work? It's a pretty straightforward concept of two positive charges repel, two negative charges repel, but opposite charges are going to attract. Well, the Corona motor is brilliant, right? Using very, very low powers, it takes advantage of this and uh, acts as a charge transfer for those two mm -mm, those two, two charges. Uh, so how does that spin? Uh, I wish I'd gotten a little bit closer on camera there, but so stage one. And keep in mind, you have an external power source on the Corona motor. So there's six fins, six, uh, six fins. There's three, uh, two sets of three. Three of the fins are positively charged or ground, 
and the other three are negatively charged. So this is a permanent situation. The fin charge does not, the charges on the fin does not change whatsoever. Every other fin is positive negative. Well, let's start with one of the negatives. As I mentioned earlier, the geometric shape of the metal makes a big difference in terms of electric field strength. So these fins have sharp little edges. You can think of them as little razors. Uh, because of the sharp edge and the high voltage they're under, the, they ionize the air directly underneath of them. This sprays electrons onto the nearest foil strip. That's important. That foil strip retains that negative charge. But the strip to the right is positively charged. And that rotor is free to move. So that foil strip will rotate over towards the positive strip and you know, it'll be pulled and pushed uh, at the same time. Now there's a charge transfer that happens as soon as that negatively charged strip on the rotor goes underneath one of the positive fins. The positive fin, again, keep in mind, it's a, it's a permanent positive charge because you have an external power source connected to it. Uh, it will strip the extra electrons off of that foil strip. It'll actually continue stripping more electrons until that foil strip is positively charged. Well, now we have the opposite result of the last situation. Before it was negatively charged and repelling, uh, being repelled away from a fixed fin. And now it's positively charged being repelled away from a positive fin. It then goes, it gets pushed away towards the next fin, which is now negatively charged. The cycle repeats and it's completely cyc cyclical. It is really, really cool. And um, the, like I said, the foil strips act as charge carriers. So you can think of it as they allow a high state of energy to flow down to a lower state of energy, which is the natural state of the universe. That's how things work. And it's completely analogous to a water wheel. I was thinking about this while I was trying to, you know, make these slides and uh, it's actually really, really analogous to a water wheel. The gravitational potential energy at the top uh, here is there's more gravitational potential energy in the water. And when the water goes down to the ground, there is less gravitational potential energy um, present in it. And what is the side effect? Well, you capitalize on that change in potential energy and you create rotational motion. The exact same thing happens with the Corona motor. You have a high voltage that wants to go down to ground level, so to speak, and you take advantage of that energy differential and you create rotational motion out of it. But um, yeah, this is, this is a really interesting process of, of how you create motion from completely static charges and you can create usable torque out of it as well. So repulsion, attraction, swapping of charges, repulsion, attraction again to the opposite thing, and those, those foil strips do all the work, analogous to a water wheel. But um, I titled this an atmospheric corona motor, right? Well, I shot a video this summer about extracting energy out of the atmosphere. It's, uh, it's a real thing, atmospheric electricity. And if you have access to a balloon or a drone or uh, even a tall tower, that gets more complicated with a tall tower, you can extract thousands of volts directly out of thin air. So what you're seeing is a very grainy blown up picture uh, freeze frame of one of my videos. This is a, my drone and the little X on the bottom of the screen is an electrode. And a better view is directly from that drone <clears throat> looking down, that is, an electrode that's about 120 meters up in the sky. And, you know, why is this important? Well, the electrostatic, uh, the, uh, the energy you're able to extract out of the atmosphere is height based. So the higher up you go, the greater of a different uh, voltage differential you, you'll be able to pull out of the sky. And so this electrode isn't just hanging underneath the drone, it's also attached to a big spool of wire and so that wire, then once I get to the height, I break off the wire and I attach it. I think I have a picture here. Yes, uh, I attach it directly to the Corona motor. The one of the inputs uh, of the Corona motor goes directly to the sky, which is a net positive charge. And then guess where the other side is connected to? It connects to ground. So uh, there you have your two power inputs. And I, again, have the PowerPoint uh, skills of a seven-year-old, so I wasn't able to put a video in here, but using atmospheric power, very, very low current at about 10,000 volts or so, um, I was able to get this chronomotor to spin up. And so that's the advantage of a chronomotor over a traditional motor, 
is you don't need a tremendous amount of current to get it spinning and get usable torque out of it. So ideally I could have gotten that. Um, AJ, you've got two minutes left. Thank you very much. Perfect, perfect. Um, ideally I would have gotten that fire bending a little bit more and not being temperamental and blowing out like crazy. Um, but uh, I, I encourage you to look into this and hopefully I've turned a, a couple of gears into what is actually possible with high voltage physics. Uh, hopefully you're curious and inquisitive. And if I've inspired at least one of you watching to, you know, take a dib, uh, take a, a, a deep dive into the plasma verse like me, then like, I'm, I'm really happy. So, um, but. Hey Jay, it's, uh, it's Mike. I think we got our timing off. I think you actually have like uh, about five minutes left on your scheduled time. Sorry about that. Oh, hey, no worries. No worries. I'm actually closing up here. And as you guys can kind of see, you know, I uh, appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much. I'm not going to attempt to say, I'll, okay, I'll try. Arigato gozaimasu, gracias, grazie, merci. However you say that in Russian and you good old chap. Um, appreciate all you guys listening to my talk and I encourage all of you in your free time to just dig further and like see what is capable with high voltage physics. So thank you. Okay. I guess I'm gonna be over in the discord now for uh, questions and answers. Thank you.